All right, so um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Martin Stahl. Uh, Martin received his PhD in theoretical chemistry from the University of Marburg in Germany um, under the supervision of Professor Franken. And then in 1997, he joined Roche as a computational chemist working on structure-based design projects at the Basel and Palo Alto sites. So he switched sides of the Atlantic Oceans, uh, uh, Ocean a few times. Um, in 2001, he was appointed head of molecular design at Roche in Basel. And from 2005 till 13, he led a medicinal chemistry team of about 40 to 60 scientists and oversaw the lead generation efforts across multiple disease areas. So he's a very, uh, almost an icon in the field. Um, since 2013, he has been head of molecular design and chemical biology at Roche, uh, a department comprising molecular design, biophysics, and biostructure research, as well as chemistry labs. Martin has also been responsible for the coordination of research informatics and cheminformatics work across Roche uh, P Red, and for more, uh, he, he has been that for more than a decade. So now he is heading the small molecule program management at Roche, and I think he is a, a very uh, 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 welcomed guest here in our series and has a lot to talk about, and I'm very um, happy to have him here. And without further ado, I will change over to Martin. And uh, where are you? There you are. And yeah, please, Martin. Um, start with the presentation and I'm very curious what you have to say today. So hello everyone, I hope everyone can see the screen now. Carsten, should that work? Uh, yeah, in a second. I think you have to click OK somewhere. There we go. So I think now we're ready. Yes, there we go. So. Uh, welcome also from my side, and Carsten, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at, with you, at least virtually, today. Um, so scaffold hopping is the topic, uh, scaffold hopping in medicinal chemistry, which is, of course, not about frogs jumping from one piece of scaffolding to another, uh, but about replacing an essential part in a drug-like molecule with something else. and. The reason why we do that in medicinal chemistry, you're all aware of the need for IP uh, and the need for dialing in or dialing out certain properties. Uh, so there are lots of reasons why we may want to change the core part of a molecule for something else. And of course, there are many ways of doing that. Medicinal chemists have done this for decades without any computational support in a trial and error fashion. Nowadays, we have many tools like shape matching, pharmacophore searching, but also fragment replacement, and that's largely what we're going to talk to, uh, about today. There's a little introduction into scaffold hopping. Actually, if you Google the term scaffold hopping today, I was surprised to find that this directly leads to this quotation down there, a paper we wrote about 11 years ago. Uh, still, still a nice introduction. Um, I will start right away with an example. And this is an example where computational chemistry has played relatively little role, if any role, in the scaffold replacement itself. But the example shows very nicely what the questions and also what the difficulties are when you do that. It's a case of cathepsin S inhibitor design. It's been published two years ago. and. It started with a question. The question was, how can we build versatile scaffolds for cathepsin S inhibitors based on what is already known, but with the potential to really tune properties in a very, very detailed manner? And this slide here shows what, at the time when we started, was known about cathepsin S inhibitors. Of course, this is not everything that was known, but these were two key scaffolds that uh, our project leader Wolfgang Haab took into account at the time. You can see on the left-hand side, this is a uh, cathepsin S inhibitor from Merck. This is a, still a peptidic scaffold to some extent. Um, well, at least it has one amide bond. And you, would, you see it's open chain. It reaches all the three key pockets, and it has a nitrile that 
uh, binds to the cysteine in the active site. On the right hand side you see a cyclic scaffold again uh, linked by amides so the peptidic nature somewhere is still in there in these structures um, but this time you have a, a six-membered ring as a central scaffold and because it's a cathepsin K inhibitor and it was designed to be one it only needs to reach to two pockets the S2 pocket is virtually non-existent in cathepsin K and so the concept here was to bring together that information and you can see that on this slide here and to figure out how uh, those two scaffolds could be merged and to uh, be connected in such a way that we could reach all the three pockets that are available in cathepsin S. And the design concept is shown here on the right hand side. Uh, uh, the chemist chose a five-membered ring. Five-membered rings of course have the advantage that they have a certain inherent flexibility and that flexibility allows them to adapt a little bit uh, to the pockets that they bind to. We had made uh, uh, good experience with these kinds of scaffolds in factor 10a before and so chose to reuse those here. Um, now before I tell you where we are going with this, Carsten has something for you. Yeah, uh, we prepared a small and I think this is an excellent opportunity to ask um, who you guys are. Um, so if you um, now would like to uh, state uh, whether you are a computational chemist, a medicinal chemist, biologist, biologist crystallographer, or none of the above, um, please enter your vote now and I'll give you uh, a little more time. Seems like this is a pretty even distribution, more or less. I'll give you some more time and I will close the poll in five, four, three, two, one. So it looks like we have a majority of medicinal chemists here, 48%, closely followed by computational chemists, and then we have a few biologists in the audience and 10% state that there are none of the above. Thank you very much. And please, Martin, continue with your presentation. All right. Um, so the result, or one of the results of uh, this uh, design concept is shown on this slide. You see a compound here that has this five-membered ring scaffold and has a 270 nanomolar affinity, which is not huge. If I was in a live audience now, I would ask, can you see, can you spot what's wrong with that structure? Uh, I can't do that here, but I would like to draw your attention to the conformation of the sulfonamide at the center. It turns out that that sulfonamide is not in its lowest energy conformation. But if you switch from a sulfonamide to the sulfone, which is happening here, then you have a significant, a very significant boost in activity. Now that sulfone is in its preferred energy uh, conformation. On the next slide you see the difference again. So the top panel shows uh, a little bit more of a complicated graph. Uh, this is the reason why that is so, is that we sim cannot simply take a simple torsion angle profile for a sulfonamide because the torsion angle and the nitrogen pyramidalization do depend on each other. But if you look at the scatter plot here on this left hand arm of uh, uh, on this left hand band of active structures there's a strong correlation between like I said the distance between uh, the plane and uh, the, uh, the nitrogen atom and the torsion angle. All the torsion angles there follow the same pattern the preferred energy, uh, low energy conformation of sulfonamides is always the nitrogen lone pair has to bisect the two oxygen atoms. This is not the case in this orange structure on the right hand side. Whereas in the lower panel, there we can use a simple torsion histogram. Here you can clearly see that the preferred conformation is in this roughly 60 degree angle that we uh, see in this green structure on the right hand side. And this all goes to say that it's extremely important to take into account conformational aspects when you play, replace a fragment in the center of a structure with something else. So that is something that whether we use computational tools right from the beginning 
or only later to check what we've been doing, confirmation is central in uh, scaffold replacement. Uh, so this is essentially the lead into the computational part of the talk. We'll be talking largely about applications of ReCore. Now ReCore is based on an idea that is older than ReCore, and that is a tool called Caveat, which was built by uh, Paul Bartlett and his team already in the 90s. Now Caveat um, followed a relatively simple but really very cool idea, namely you take two exit vectors of a scaffold and you define by taking, by placing those exit vectors in space, a distance between them, two angles and one dihedral angle. That essentially fixes the system in space. And then of course you can take a database of 3D structures and convert them into a database of vectors and uh, try and match those vectors onto the scaffold that you're trying to replace and in this way find replacements. Uh, that was the idea of Caveat. This is what, it, what was implemented. When we got interested in scaffold hopping at Roche and together with the uh, group of Matthias Rarai in Hamburg, we went back to that idea and said we want to really build a very fast and versatile tool that, that essentially uses this principle. And so out came ReCore, uh, which was published in, in, in 2007, uh, 2006 it says here. Um, and it, I'd like to briefly introduce that. The, the concept behind ReCore is the same as um, for Caveat, but we've put a lot of effort at the time into how those fragments are selected and um, how they're used later in the replacement process. So the structures are extracted from the Cambridge Structural Database. That's a database that uh, you probably all know. This is the world's repository of structural data, small molecule structures. And a lot of filtering had to take place so we could really make best use of that database. Uh, the first box describes essentially which structures were, were taken out from, from the beginning. Then we had to have a, a set of rules that told us which uh, carbon element single bonds could be cleaved. Of course, we didn't want to have cuts in highly congested areas because those are the systems that are very likely to be in high energy conformations, for example, quaternary centers, close to a ring system, and so, and so on, to, re to increase the chances that when we use those fragments again, they would still be in conformations that are low in energy. And then, of course, there's a lot of work in terms of filtering out undesirable fragments, removing duplicates, removing things that are simple and trivial, like phenyl rings, cyclohexyl rings that come up again and again, and to make sure that they only occur once or twice. So that's what that's the uh, part on the CSD side that went into building Recall, and, and I'm not going to refer to all the details of how Recall. Uh, is actually faster than anything we've seen before in terms of algorithms and, and, and interface. Um, suffice it to say that the end, in the end you have a set of features assigned to fragments. So the seven-membered ring here could be one of the fragments. There are exit vectors annotated. Uh, these are the ones that were in the original CSD structure. And then there are additional pharmacophore features like acceptors or donors. So this is what's stored in the database, and this is what's queried. Then we also looked at a number of retrospective examples, uh, like the one here on the left-hand side. This is a peptide hormone, which uh, comes in the shape of this roughly triangular pharmacophore, and it was relatively straightforward with record to find replacements that looked like the ones that had been published many years ago by the Olsen group. So this was sort of a retrospective proof of concept that worked uh, that, that showed that this kind of approach can work and it can work quickly. Now we need to step back once more and think about what does that actually mean to use ReCore or a similar tool on, on a scaffold replacement question. When you do similarity searching, then usually <clears throat> you order your results by similarity. So the most similar structures come first and then you order them. And at some point, the structures have less and less similarity to the original query structure. On the other hand, the diversity, of course, increases from top to bottom. So as similarity goes down, the likelihood of finding something really novel uh, becomes much higher. And so um, the zone of interest um, 
in the uh, query is probably somewhere in this area where the blue and the green start to overlap because that's where you still have sufficient similarity but the diversity or the likelihood of finding something new is already great. And so when you apply that kind of thinking now to scaffold hopping and 3D overlays, the question is where do you have to look to find something interesting that gives you a new scaffold uh, but that maybe doesn't match the original exit vectors as precisely as you would think uh, they should. And so what I can say right away, and this is sort of preempting some of what I'm saying later, that in scaffold hopping, this is not really the case. Very diverse structures can come up very, very, or very, very high in the hit list, meaning the overlay between the vectors is near perfect, and you still have a lot of diversity in the hit uh, results. So in the end, scaffold hopping, the way Recode does it, is an idea generator. <clears throat> idea generator, ideas are generated based on just what the database has to offer and the medicinal chemist or another expert has to come in later and say this is really interesting, this is synthesizable and it makes sense and fits to the remaining SAR that I already have. So it's, a, it's an idea generator tool. Let's look at a first example. The first example we ever ran was we applied recall to this tryptase model. So tryptase is a serine protease. The uh, compound here at the time from Aventis <coughs> is a classic serine protease inhibitor with a basic group reaching into the S1 pocket down here. And uh, it's a very potent inhibitor already. And if you look at the structure in some more detail, you see there's a hydrogen bond here. Uh, somewhat angular one, and um, there's a fluorine atom attached to this phenyl ring here, which forms a nice uh, side-on interaction with the uh, CH group here from this uh, tyrosine ring. This is exactly in line with the types of things we know about interactions between um, phenyl rings and uh, fluorine atoms. Uh, this is from our interaction review from a few years ago. So all in all, a system we thought we understand well. And so we used a smaller version of this tryptase inhibitor, the one depicted here. And we uh, ran recall, and recall showed up one example that we liked in particular. This was a very close match in terms of exit vectors. So this I would still regard as a, as a fairly close uh, overlap in terms of exit vectors, because in the end, the uh, two groups uh, align very well, uh, just shifting the fennel ring a little bit more. And we also preserved this carbonyl group here, which uh, you see on the left-hand side. And out came a compound that still has this carbonyl group, as you see, has a completely different central scaffold and is about as potent on tryptase as the one that we had uh, put in. So we thought, hey, that's great. We have succeeded and we know how scaffold, scaffold hopping works. Um, in reality, however, we later found out that we were just about half right um, because what you see in the overlay between the crystal structures here, uh, these are now not exactly the compounds I showed you before, but slightly different ones with an acetylene bridge here, not a direct phenyl linking. Um, what you see is that this central fragment in this yellow structure has exactly the same conformation that we predicted but the whole thing is turned around. So it's really the, ir the mirror image. If I just flip back to this structure here, you see it's the same conformation, but it's flipped around by 180 degrees. So essentially we have uh, the same conformation, uh, but the overlay is slightly different. And the lesson here is, of course, never tr trust your first model binding mode. Uh, what happened is that this angular bind, um, Hydrogen bond isn't worth very much. Instead, this one is formed. Uh, so the carbonyl group is there. It just flips around and forms a different hydrogen bond. I think we have a brief interruption here, and after that, we're back. Yeah, we have another poll for you, which again fits quite perfectly into the presentation. Um, since this is very medicinal chemistry laden, um, and you are a majority of medicinal chemists, I would like to ask you, um, if you are a medicinal chemist, how much do you use software for compound modification and ideation? So please give us your answers here. You can say all the time, this is my bread and butter tool, or 
I would if I had a good tool. I like to draw on paper rather than in the computer. We've had that also. Um, and you do all this of this in your head. Okay, and the bolts are coming in. I seem to have a pretty obvious winner here. I give you a Which little is? more time. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll share it in a second. Um, I'll give you a little more time, and I close the poll in five, four, three, two, one. Okay, here are the results. So most of the people would if they had a good tool. So maybe, Martin, you can convince them that you guys have the right tool at, your, at hand. Um, some already have or seem to have a bread and butter tool, and then 10 and 7% respectively do this in their head or on paper. Thank you very much for that, and please, Martin, continue. Excellent. So let's go on. So I've given you a first example. Um, this is what frequently happens. Uh, if, if you do need a structure-based design controlled by experimental crystal structures to understand whether you're still on track. The second example is another one from a well-known target, BASE. I think everyone knows that uh, BASE is really difficult to, to drug, um, but once people figured out that you need an amidine-like head group, like the one I'm circling here, uh, the race really began, and now there's a broad variety of tool compounds in that space available. This compound that I'm depicting here is a very rough prototype of an inhibitor, which came out of a focus screen that we did uh, while our project was uh, already ongoing. It's uh, very lipophilic, it's not very active, and we still try to use it a little bit as a template to figure out what else we could do with the target. And applying recall to this, and you see the two cut points here, the yellow arrows, um, to the S1, S3 prime uh, pocket, which is one big lipophilic area, um, gave us a number of new examples of how we could fill that pocket in a different way. And we used the scaffold to just play around a little bit with alternatives. And so recall proposed, instead of that one central phenyl ring, a cyclopropyl ketone, which is something rather unusual in MedChem. And then we made a few compounds, and the matched pair that I'm showing you is not exactly the one depicted here, but it looks slightly different. This is a slightly optimized compound on the S1 side. And you can see that the transfer of SAR works. Uh, you have, again, roughly equipotent compounds, slightly more potent on the cyclopropyl ketone side. And so, obviously, this is another scaffold hope that was successful. Now, what does it tell us? Um, you can look at confirmations again a little bit. Cyclopropyl ketones, or what you see here, the corresponding amide, have very clear preferred confirmations. So the uh, carbonyl group bisects, again, the um, tricyclic ring here. And there is a very clear preference for this zero degree angle uh, with respect to the bisection point uh, on this bond right here. So a very clear confirmation of preference. If you now overlay this with a phenyl ring, you can see that actually the overlay is, is very good. So of course, a torsion angle has a zero degree torsion, uh, sorry, the um, uh, meta-substituted benzene has a zero degree torsion angle. And the distance here is roughly 2.4 angstroms between the two exit vectors. And the cyclopropyl ketone has, also has a very, very small torsion angle here. Uh, it's not zero, but it's about 10 degrees, and the distance is 2.5 angstrom, so that's a very close match for uh, structural features that are very, very different, really, in terms of chemistry. And so um, you see that that match, in this case, is exactly replicated in the crystal structures that we later obtained for related compounds. Uh, so the phenyl ring is indeed replaced by the cyclopropyl ketone, um, and there are some additional observations you can make so in terms of water structure. Uh, what's interesting is that that carbonyl group, uh, the newly introduced one, now has a water interaction, which is bridging um, a carbonyl group in the active site with the carbonyl group of the cyclopropyl ketone. 
And if you overlay with the crystal structure of the corresponding phenyl compound, you can see that that water molecule is still there. Uh, and it's just slightly displaced, but it doesn't form that bridging interaction. So that's just sort of a side observation in terms of molecular interactions. It does seem to contribute a very, very tiny bit to the um, overall uh, binding affinity here. But you can see that in this case, the prediction was exactly spot on. Now, we're not necessarily always interested in cyclopropyl ketones, of course, in MedChem. What we would like to have is something that's metabolically more stable, and so you can also play around with amides here instead of ketones. We've done some of that work. It didn't lead very far, but it was a nice example of how scaffold hopping can, can contribute to diversity. And diversity is also the topic of my next example. This is a project that uh, place in the metabolic area. We were working uh, for a while on a lipase called hormone-sensitive lipase. Uh, the idea was to reduce the level of circulating triglycerides and I'm not going to go into the bio biology here. Suffice it to say that we ran an HGS campaign and the HGS campaign turned out to yield some of the first non-covalent, non-irreversible uh, inhibitors of that lipase. And there's a prototype structure here on the left-hand side. Medicinal chemistry took that up uh, because it was already active in cells, albeit just we, uh, weakly, weakly active. Um, and it turned that into an early lead with this uh, spiral uh, uh, structure on the right-hand side. This compound even showed some first um, uh, active activity in vivo. So it sound, looked like a good basis for further optimization. Um, I have to now go to a slightly different molecular design topic, which was really important in this case, and that is, oops, we have a new poll, so hang on. Last we'll poll for today, I promise. Um, so how much do you think a good software tool could help in innovation and efficiency? Um, and again, there are four answers. Uh, either you don't believe in software at all, and or you say it's hard to find the right one, um, or you say software can help, but most is done on paper, uh, or the right kind of software would help us be more efficient. Answers are coming in, and this is a very, very clear outcome here. I'll give you five more seconds. Five, four, Three, two, one. So most of the people say 77% the right kind of software would help us be more efficient. Thanks so much. And now please, Martin, continue. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in this particular case, we, we wanted some additional information that could help us guide the uh, structure-based design. But there was no structure-based design because there was no crystal structure. We only had very remotely related uh, templates for homology model. And three of them are depicted here. So these are all uh, lipases or lipase-like structures. Here's an esterase um, that don't have a very high sequence homology. And in fact, if you just look at the identity, it's really low, uh, just between uh, 12 and 15%. We nevertheless endeavored to build a homology model of HSL because in the active site region, the homology was reasonably high and came up with something that looks like this. Uh, so the green uh, bits are now the homology model. And there was a tentative uh, modeling of the lead compound into that active site. And actually, uh, the relative rigidity of that structure helped us to do the modeling because this compound essentially only has two conformations. Um, it can either have the spiral ring in a pseudo axial orientation of the for the carbonyl group or in a pseudo equatorial one, as depicted here. And in the pseudo equatorial position, the carbonyl group really reaches out into the solvent or something else that's polar. And so it make, made sense to model that into the oxy anion hole. And if, if you fix that part of the molecule, then the rest, the sulfonamide, essentially falls into, in place because, again, there's this preferred conformation of sulfonamides that we've talked about before. So effectively, this L-shaped structure here of the compound is fixed. And it did fit very nicely the 
active site shape that we see here. And then uh, what uh, we did, or what uh, Tanya did, who did the modeling in this case, um, was she essentially went away from this atomistic representation and essentially said, let's only use roughly the shape information because otherwise we get bogged down into too much of the atomistic detail, which isn't really there because it's just a crude homology model. And so this is what the, the model now looks like. There's a oxyanion hole. There's a diversity vector because in that space here on the left-hand side, there's more lipophilic room for uh, further interactions, but there's only a narrow channel on the right-hand side here uh, where the trifluoromethoxy group sits. And so one of the first questions from chemistry was how can we now generate more diversity in chemical space because the compound as such wasn't yet what it should be in terms of solubility, in terms of HERC, in terms of um, uh, lipophilicity and so on. And so uh, what Tanya did was she hypothesized that in this particular case you could probably replace the uh, sulfonamide with something else that's polar and this is this switch is depicted here. Um, so she said that it's very likely uh, that the uh, glutamine side chain that we see here interacts in a uh, hydrogen bonding fashion with the um, uh, sulfonamide. And so if that's the case, then maybe we can turn this around and use the glutamine side chain as an acceptor instead of a donor and maybe uh, end up with something that carries a hydroxy group. And that switch worked, so that prediction uh, uh, was successful. This has nothing to do with uh, uh, scaffold hopping as such, but it is a hypothesis based on uh, a, a homology model that worked. And there's much more to this story, which I'm showing here. Uh, you can show, you can see that the whole picture is really consistent because you can play with chirality now. Uh, on the bottom uh, left, you see two compounds. This is an enantiomeric pair, where the enantiomer that has the right kind of conformation to interact with the glutamine is more potent, and this potency is more pronounced. You can see this on the right hand side here. If you have an additional alkyl side chain, which would, of course, uh, lead to a stronger repulsions on the polar side if you invert it and end up with the wrong enantiomer. So it all looked as if there's something really uh, solid to this hypothesis. Um, now, back to scaffold hopping, once we had the spiral compound, you could then also say, well, how about replacing that? And we have the spiral bicyclic system here. We can uh, of course, hypothesize that again, like in the case before, the carbonyl group is probably important because we need it in the oxyanion hole. And so um, the question was, what else can we do and which other substructures uh, can be uh, put in place of this spiral bicyclic system? And in this particular case, we used ReCore not only on the CSD as such, the whole CSD, but we used it in combination with a fragment database that we had made ourselves from our internal building block lists. Um, and we have, uh, we had an initiative on generating additional bicyclic structures like these. And so uh, it's always useful then to have, um, to have those available in your scaffold hopping tools as well, uh, because then you can make faster decisions on what to make next. Building blocks are already there. And so you can see here two examples at the bottom where you can see that roughly that kind of replacement does work, although in this case you do lose a lot of affinity. But these were just a few of the first compounds that were made. And the next picture shows you another type of uh, overlap, which is exactly the same thing, but this time with the hydroxy compound. Um, and at the bottom you see already a completely different type of structure, which now carries this hydroxyl group, not the sulfonamide or an amide anymore and um, uh, again is in a reasonable potency range. And so what this whole exercise did for us or for the project team was that it significantly broadened chemical space. Uh, this uh, display of six structures is essentially just a small list of all the combinations you can now do. Um, spiral, bicyclic, 5-5, five, 6-5, five, five, with hydroxy, with uh, without hydroxy but with a urea, 
There are all kinds of things you can do. And so this combined homology modeling and scaffold hopping exercise really led the project team into a relatively broad space where now the main focus was no longer on making more active compounds, but making compounds that that have the right physical chemical properties. And so uh, in this case, really, the impact on the project was, was very significant. And already now, at the end of my presentation, um, I would briefly like to thank those who uh, helped here, and in particular, those who really did all the work. So the Cathepsin S example was the lead chemist was Wolfgang Harp, and Harald Mauser did the modeling, Triptase, Bernd Kuhn and Wolfgang Harp, Base 1, Wolfgang Guber and Wolfgang Harp, so you see Wolfgang Harp several times here, um, and then HSL uh, by Tanja schulz gasch and Werner Neidhardt. Finally, in terms of uh, making, making it all happen on the computational side, there's a significant portion of input, of course, from the CCDC, who take care of the CSD database, in particular Colin Broom, and then the people who built ReCore and the Biosolve IT team for turning it, turning it into something that's still available today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Martin, for this exciting presentation. I think this gave a, a wonderful overview um, over scaffold hopping and how it could really drive projects forward. Um, there are a few questions here that I would like to address to you, if that's okay with you. Sure. Um, so the question was, um, you, you obviously showed very uh, successful applications of scaffold hopping. Were there any uh, cases where scaffold hopping didn't work or didn't work so well? Um, were there any failures as well? Yes, there, there are always failures as well. Um, in particular, um, things become difficult when you have to rely on modeled bioactive conformations or completely in the absence of biostructural data. What frequently happens there is that you overlay a number of active compounds. You may have a very good educated guess for what the joint conformational space is. But the pitfall in those cases is always that you tend to overlay structures in a much more tighter way than they really overlay if you had the full information about the uh, experimental bioactive conformations. And so you sort of start to trick yourself into believing that all these compounds share common binding mode, whereas in reality they don't. And if that's the case, then you can use all the scaffold hopping in the world. You will not, you will not find uh, the right solutions there. And that is something that, that we've done too, uh, because uh, it's, such, it's such a tempting thing to do, to, uh, to really overlay structures and to look for all those commonalities, which always exist, but right. in many cases are not real. So on the other hand, then, uh, would you say that the use of especially ReCore, but, but also other uh, software um, made your work more efficient? If, so if you have a situation where you understand the conformation of your system well, so it's either very restrained or you do have information from some form of experiment that tells you this is the bioactive conformation, or you can build a good hypothesis to test it, then I think uh, those tools start to really make sense. Uh, so in our cases, the ones that I've shown you, I mean, HSL is clearly a case where we had absolutely no clue what the uh, 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 bioactive but the binding mode would be, uh, we guessed our way into uh, understanding this. But you have to have a clear hypothesis. And for, for HSL, what helped us was this relative rigidity of the structure. So mm -hmm. we could then uh, replace the central piece, which is rigid anyway. So in cases where you have no clue about bioactive conformation and possibly the ligand is rather flexible, it wouldn't necessarily make sense to use something like ReCore. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Um, what about water structures? I think we have to separate this question into two um, into two sections. Did you already use water structures in your predictions? Did, did Recore make use of that? 
Um, no, we did not. Um, what we did, or what, what we always do is we uh, use the types of constraints that we think are important. So, for example, in those two cases that you saw, preserving a carbonyl group, um, uh, but then in other cases also introducing new functional groups. Mm -hmm. The um, uh, water structure then comes into play when you take those results of recall and put them into the context of the binding mode. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always an important exercise to just, you know, to, to really scrutinize those results in detail. Right. Um, based on confirmation, interactions, and other properties. And of course, uh, what I maybe didn't mention as much in the end as I should have is the lesson from that cathepsin example is you have to also look at the confirmations of those pieces that you newly introduce. So the exit vector to the pieces that are already in place in the compound need to be carefully looked at so you understand whether those torsions are, uh, are okay as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can say from, from my perspective that the recall we are uh, currently offering um, does take water into account if the user wishes uh, to, to take it into account. So uh, you can use recore not only just in uh, on the ligand side, but you can use recore in the context of the protein utilizing um, pharmacophore points on the on the protein actives in the protein active site. Uh, and if you happen to have water molecules in your active site, you can use this information as well and even use them as exit vectors. Uh, for example, for a, um, a, a fragment growing um, or even a fragment replacement or core replacement exercise. Okay, well, I think uh, there are no more questions. Oh, no, there are actually quite a few more questions here. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Uh, I didn't see the scroll bar in this. Uh, so um, one question that obviously did not get um, addressed uh, already, or the answer to that is, uh, and that's that's a question that we get all the time from people who are interested in Recore. Um, does Recore have a good scoring function to help filter out some of the ideas? I think, Martin, you need to uh, stress this point uh, one more time, how Recore is really, or how the, uh, solutions are coming in and, and um, how they are you know, uh, filtered uh, and, and the, the solutions that are on the top of the list, what they really say okay. about your system. Yeah. So initially when Recall produces results, they are simply ranked by how well they fit to the exit vectors and the additional pharmacophore constraints that you define. So there's, there's, no, there's no scoring involved. It's simply how good is the replacement in terms of geometry. And everything else that comes afterwards needs to be looked at in the context of the problem that you're currently trying to solve. And this could either be you just look at confirmation, if that's all you know, or you place them into a binding site and score them there with whatever your favorite method for that is, or just by visual inspection. Um, that's, that's the concept. And it works beautifully because really, um, I, I think what the examples that I just showed also illustrate is that what it really does is it generates diversity in ideas. And if you, whether you're a medicinal chemist or a computational chemist, when you sit in front of a screen and just try to be creative, then you will find ideas, but you will never be exhaustive. And this is what Recore and tools like Recore help you to do. Yeah, and I, I think we need to also stress that as soon as you uh, take a recourse solution, uh, in case you have been using, for example, the CSD as a, as a fragment uh, library, um, and you start to minimize the structure, you lose the information about the bioactive conformation. The, the torsion energy is a lot different in a crystal structure than it is for a calculated structure. That's also something that uh, we can't stress enough uh, because this different is uh, can be what messes up your bioactive conformation for your newly generated compound. Yeah, looking um, at confirmation is key. Then another question was, have you used docking as an orthogonal tool to validate the recourse solutions? Or maybe uh, to broaden this question, what have you done with the recourse solutions afterwards? So uh, we at Roche, we believe a lot in, in this interactive dialogue between 
the computational chemists and the medicinal chemists. So the most productive way of using these is uh, to go through a first filtering just based on computational um, uh, principles, things like clustering, things like weeding out stuff that des definitely doesn't fit, and then really to sit down with the chemists and discuss what, what makes sense, what's doable, what's synthesizable, and um, to take it from there. But no, we would not take, and we haven't done this, um, take uh, classic scoring functions because they don't help us. They're not better at ranking than we are uh, as, as the experts. Unless you are probably generating like a, a cluster of doc solutions, right? I mean, sometimes um, you do get a lot of solutions and you, uh, apart from the fact that the medicinal chemist also decides which structures are easily synthesizable, um, sometimes uh, docking uh, can help um, selecting uh, certain conformations better because they, they do the doc solutions do cluster well in the active site sometimes and, and that might give you a hint that this is a more preferred uh, conformation uh, to choose from, right? Yeah, but again, you can, you can pull yourself there and, and just mm -hmm. see something that a computational tool does pref preferentially, but that doesn't mean that it's real. Right. So yeah. there's, there's a lot of, of visual inspection that needs to be done. Right. Um, I think you kind of gave the answer to the next question already. Um, recourse sometimes or oftentimes produces uh, uh, obviously more than one solution, but also a solution that is very, or a cluster of solution that's very close uh, to each other in terms of geometry. So how do you decide which one to go with? I, you kind of said it already, but if you just uh, repeat that again. Yeah, so when they're very close, then it's really about taking one of those examples and really looking at it in detail and seeing is there a, a modification needed. Anyway, what we do with recall results is we, we don't always just take them as they come. They come maybe with a piece of substituent here or there or a heteroatom here or there that you don't need or don't want. And so you have to go and really modify them and make them fit to the problem uh, or to solve the problem that you're currently trying to solve. So it's less about <coughs> choosing one out of several related, but taking all those as just ideas and turning them into what you really want to synthesize. An ensemble, so to say. Yeah. And then also, of course, the medicinal chemist who is who should be part of the team uh, looking at the results, they, they obviously also um, decide which structures they like the best because they have this intuition and, and they know which ones are easily synthesizable and where they can make those modifications that you um, mentioned. Right. Okay, uh, one of the last questions, oh, there's a few more coming in, this seems to be a hot topic for, for the audience. Um, so, do you prioritize solutions which uh, with with the best overlap of exit vectors. I think, yeah, that's that's what um, Martin already mentioned, that this is kind of the way that recall works. Um, so the it's it's really a geometric fit. Uh, there's scoring, if you if you want to call it that way. Um, so the, the solutions that have the best overlap with the exit vectors chosen um, are ranked the highest. Um, and we have to decide between exit vectors and feature vectors Exit vectors are usually the first two bond vectors that you choose, and the next bond vectors, if there are more, or pharmacophore vectors, um, uh, they are um, then the feature vectors that do play a role for solution selection, but um, not quite. Uh, they are not quite prioritized as high as the as the first two vectors that are chosen. Uh, then another question uh, that I think I can answer is, um, can you use Record to grow? Uh, yes, you can. I don't think, uh, Martin, that was possible in the version that first came out, right? Uh, we, we only introduced that later um, in yep. when, when Recore was introduced into Lead IT. So yes, you can use it to grow either from just the information you have on your um, molecule or you can use the protein active site um, in, uh, as information to grow to uh, a certain pharmacophore, for example. Um, it has to be a directed interaction, so something like a hydrogen bond or a directed hydrophobic interaction from a phenyl ring, for example, to use. Um, and it's, it's a pretty strict um, 
way of growing um, that has to be kept in mind. But yes, you 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 can do that. All right. Um, is it necessary to remove the protein structure? Uh, no. Uh, I mean, you can you can work without the protein structure, and that's the way I think you guys have been using it at the time. Correct. Yes, I mean, recall as such does not look at a protein structure. Uh, if you want to, it does consider these various different additional f features uh, that you just described. Uh, but, but as such, it's just a geometric tool. Yeah. Then uh, there's another interesting question, which maybe wasn't quite uh, addressed uh, enough yet. Um, what method does RICO use to handle conformational flexibility? I think that's an important point to make again, how this exactly works. So it, it does not change the conformation of what you put in. It just overlays pieces that are rigid onto other pieces that are rigid. And the result will be a compound. If you So if the fragments all come from the, the CSD, then the central piece will have a CSD conformation, hopefully, of course, a low energy conformation. And then the two additional torsion angles that are created will have uh, primarily an uncontrolled conformation, so one that is not under experimental control, so to say. These are the ones of the new bonds that are formed, and these are the ones that need the most scrutiny afterwards when you filter, when you analyze. Uh, but there's no uh, further optimization, no minimization, and that is on purpose because we really want to preserve that crystal structure confirmation of what the CSD provides. Exactly. So, yeah, the, the, on, the, the only bonds that one need to worry about in the confirmational search and quotation marks um, are the bonds that we have broken. So the, the pieces of the ligand that remain where they are, the, the attachment to the protein, um, the, the pharmacophore points, so to say, um, they are they are rigid, and the piece that we extract and replace is also rigid. And it's maybe important to say also that we only replace one rigid fragment at a time. We don't piece together um, fragments in this gap that we created on the ligand, but um, RECOR, uh, when it generates the index, uses something what we call a fragment enumeration um, that is... Um, when you have a molecule that you break into pieces, A, B, and C, um, RICO will also produce as a fragment, a fragment A, B, a fragment B, C, and even if, if uh, given by the rules, a fragment A, B, C, maybe minus a methyl group or a proton. So you will be able to bridge much larger gaps um, with this um, fragment confirmation information that you have uh, from the CSD or from another high quality crystal structure library that you might be using. Um, one of the last questions then is how many natural product like fragments are included in the original library? So I think that um, is addressing the library that you guys were using, the CSD based one. Oh, um, so that's a tough one because, of course, we took uh, fragments only in the end, so I don't have a full overview of what those original structures all looked like, but the CSD does not contain uh, a huge proportion of natural products. Um, and in the end, whether they're natural products or not doesn't really matter to us. What we wanted was fragments, used-to-use -use fragments that later could actually be employed in medicinal chemistry. So not things that are completely unusual or whatever, metallorganic or something like that, but really um, things that have, have a relatively, um, uh, that, that have some, some, some tractability associated to them. That's what all this filtering was about. And of course, those fragments can come from a natural product or can come from something completely different, which is maybe not even associated with the life sciences, it just has to be a fragment that, that that's useful in the, in the context. Okay, thank you for answering uh, these questions in such great detail. And I think um, that was an excellent combination of presentation and, and question session. Um, thanks again for having been our 
uh, guest speaker today. It was a pleasure to have you and a very interesting presentation you gave. Um, and I just wanted to let the audience know that um, we will give out uh, licenses to Recore and CSAR to everyone who participated today. Please give us a few days uh, for organizational purposes to uh, send those out. Um, let's say uh, up to a week it, it can take until you should have them in your hands. And again, this uh, the recording of this webinar will be available on our webinar page underneath this webinar as well as the slides. Uh, uh, actually, Martin, would you be willing to provide the slides as PDF? I haven't asked you this, but um, would that be possible? I can do that. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, the, the slides will also be uh, available as PDF underneath uh, the, the past webinar next to the recording. And um, let me point out to you again, the next webinar will already be November 4 uh, at 10 uh, Eastern or 4 p.m. Uh, Central European time. Um, Didier Roche from Edelvis will be our next guest speaker. Thanks to Martin again very much. And to every one of our listeners, have a great rest of the day or evening, uh, and see you on November 4 then. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Carsten. Thank you, Martin.